Hey, little buddies, it's Uncle Rick from the Uncle Rick Audio Book Club. Two great audiobooks for kids every month and lots of fun learning videos. Today, we are reading a chapter from Betsy Ross. Yes, indeed, you've heard her name before. The young lady who sewed the very first American flag. As we begin this chapter called The Flag, Betsy has just lost her husband in an explosion of gunpowder as he was serving in the war. But let's begin and let it tell the story. Betsy was 24 years old at the time of John's death. She had many problems to solve. The unsettled times had affected the business of the little shop, and she must work hard and faithfully if she would keep the little home and upholstery shop. So she locked her grief in the innermost recesses of her heart and set about seeing how she could earn enough to make the home secure. She worked early and late, taking extra needlework to make up for the lack of upholstery work. Everyone knew of her work and was glad to help whenever possible, and her fame as a needlewoman had traveled far. One day a lady came to Philadelphia from Baltimore, the beautiful lady Betsy had admired so many years ago. While staying with a friend and being entertained by her, she had the misfortune to tear a very fine dress of satin brocade. Upon inquiry as to where it could be mended, Betsy Ross was suggested. The lady brought the dress to the shop herself. Imagine Betsy's amazement at again meeting this lovely woman. Many years had passed, but they had touched her lightly and she was still a vision of loveliness. Well, my dear child of long ago, so you're the expert needlewoman, Betsy Ross, that I've heard so much about, exclaimed Madam Cook. I am delighted to see thee again, dear lady, said Betsy. Will thee have a chair and perhaps a cup of tea? I have really come on business to ask for your help, but I will enjoy the visit and cup of tea if you have the time to spare from your shop. At this hour it is seldom busy, and there are few customers just now. The times are unsettling and not good for business answered Betsy as she led the way to the sitting room in back of the shop. Madam Cook showed Betsy the tear in her gown, and Betsy assured her she could mend it. Then she went below stairs to her basement kitchen to fetch the hot water and tea things. While her guests sipped the tea, Betty worked on the gown, and they talked of the happenings of the intervening years. Captain Cook was in charge of a ship defending the coast off the shores of Virginia. Madam had come to Philadelphia by coach to stay for a while with dear friends. The lovely house in Baltimore was closed. Betsy told of her recent sorrow and her efforts to keep the shop going. Her friend was deeply touched to think one so young should have had to make so great a sacrifice in the cause of the colonies. The dress was mended, and when Madam Cook inspected it, she exclaimed, Why, the darn is the handsomest part of the dress. The visit over, this gracious lady took her leave of Betsy and returned to her friend's home, where she told all those she met of the excellence of Betsy's work. Her visit had cheered Betsy. These were hard days and lonely ones, but her friends tried to help ease the loneliness. She was often invited to the Claypools to spend the evening with John Claypool's sisters, and the drinkers invited her to be with them. Elizabeth Drinker and her rounds of errands called often at the shop to say a cheery word. It was a day and time of continual change. General Washington had gone from Philadelphia to Boston and was busy training and drilling his army and bringing in the cannon and ammunition captured at Fort Ticonderoga, preparatory to striking a great blow at the British troops. At dawn on the 5th of March, 1776, British General Howe woke to find that during the night General Washington's army, under cover of heavy cannonading, which the British had helped by answering, had brought up and placed in position enough artillery to command Boston Harbor. There were enough guns to blow up every British ship in the harbor. The British first thought they would attempt to hold their position, but remembering Bunker Hill decided against it and quietly sailed out of the harbor. The news of this brilliant piece of strategy and the resulting victory heartened the colonists, and now General Howe had come down to New York. General Washington had sent General Lee to watch Howe, but in April came himself, bringing his whole army. In May, General Washington decided to go in person before the Congress in Philadelphia to tell them of the needs of the armies, and so again the great Washington was in Philadelphia. 
During the many months of winter, while he was preparing to strike at the British in Boston Harbor, he had thought much of the need of a banner. Since the beginning of civilization, men had always followed a banner. There was inspiration following the colors into battle that nothing else could supply. He had talked and consulted with several of his officers, and many banners had been suggested. The pine tree flag was a favorite in New England, while down in the southern colonies they had one with an anchor and stars and hope written across it. There were many flags among the troops, but there was no American flag. Washington belonged to an old English family with titles and lands granted them for services to the English king. In the stone of the pillars of their old home in Sulgrave Manor had been cut the coat of arms of the Washington family, a shield with three five-pointed stars and three stripes. Washington thought about this and its meaning in the heraldry of England. General Washington's ancestors in England were Margaret Butler and Lawrence Washington. Margaret Butler was a great lady and related to the royal family. She had a coat of arms of her own. It was entwined with her husband's, cut in sandstone on the pillars of Sulgrave Manor. The combined coat of arms had three stars of red on a background of white, with two stripes of red on the blue background of a shield. The crest was originally a raven, coming from a Danish symbol. Then later the coat of arms is seen with both the raven and the eagle, and was finally involved into the eagle atop a crown. This was the one used by the Washington family. And now the meaning of this. The five-pointed star denotes a divine quality bestowed from above, whereby men shine in virtue, learning, and works of piety, like bright stars on the earth. The bars are bars of conscience, religion, and honor. The red color denotes military fortitude and magnanimity. The eagle signifies a man of action, ever more occupied in high and mighty affairs, a man of lofty spirit. The spread wings of the eagle signify protection. The crown from which the eagle rises denotes civic honor and is applicable to the defender of a fortress. This, then, was the inspiration of the design for the American flag that General Washington gave to Betsy. It was a precious trust to make an emblem so full of the finest traditions and symbolic of the best in man. Betsy seemed to realize the tremendous responsibility that was hers to make this banner so glorious, which would wave o'er land and sea and carry this message of divine quality, honor, bravery, loyalty, magnanimity, wherever it should go. At last, Betsy had achieved a real part in the cause of the American colonies. Washington, inspired by his family coat of arms, finally drew upon a piece of paper a design for the flag. It was especially fitting for the 13 states, for states they now were. He showed this design to Robert Morris and George Ross and told them his thought concerning it. But, he asked, who will make it? George Ross immediately thought of Betsy. She had always been a favorite with him, and since his nephew, John Ross, had died, he was especially proud of her. She had tried so hard to keep up the little shop John had started, and had worked early and late so that nothing would be neglected. Her house was as neat and well cared for as in the days when she had little to do with the shop. Then she was such a fine needlewoman that he was indeed glad to recommend her to the general. "'Shall we call upon Mistress Ross?' asked General Washington. So the three men started down the street toward the upholstery shop. It was a lovely day in June. The roses were blooming in the garden. Betsy had opened the doors and windows to let in the warm sunshine. She had placed some roses in a bowl on the drop-leaf table that stood against the wall. The lovely ruffled curtains at the window stirred softly in the breeze. The house was all in order, and Betsy had gone into the shop to work on a cushion covering. She was seated near the large show window that looked out upon the street. Looking up, she saw three men approaching her door. They stopped. She was amazed. Why should they come to her shop? The great George Washington, the wealthy Robert Morris, and accompanying them, John's uncle, George Ross, a member of the Continental Congress. She opened the door and greeted them with graceful courtesy and a pleasant good day. She was trying not to show her excitement. "'Pray, gentlemen, what can I do for you?' she asked in her sweet voice. Uncle George Ross spoke up, introducing Betsy to the great men. "'They've come to see you about making a banner,' he said. 
Will you come into my sitting room, gentlemen, and be seated? asked Betsy in her most gracious manner. The gentlemen noticed the neatness of the shop as they passed through, and when they came into the sitting room, were much impressed with its coziness and artistic arrangement. Through the open door at the back could be seen the lovely garden, the dainty, attractive curtains at the window, the bowl of roses upon the table, all spoke plainly of the care and love of the mistress. Long ago, Betsy had laid aside the Quaker dress when she married John Ross, and on that lovely June day, she was indeed a pretty picture in her dress of silken stuff with softly draped over skirt, lace at the neck and elbows, lace cap and apron, dainty slippers with square silver buckles. The chestnut curl showed under the little cap that framed the sweet face with the large, deep blue eyes. Your home is most attractive, observed the general. You would not remember, General, but years ago we met in Alexandria, Virginia, at the home of Thomas Carlyle. They took us on an expedition of the dungeons in the fort below and into the gardens. We were much honored. Well, bless my soul, I do remember. Two little Quaker girls. But you see, I must be pardoned for not recognizing you because the Quaker dress is missing. And he looked at it with a smiling, inquiring expression on his face. My husband, John Ross, was not a Quaker. Ah, oh, I have heard of your loss, said the general, his voice filled with tender sympathy. So early in this conflict. You have been asked to give a great deal in our cause, and now we are here to ask you to do something more for us. Thee spoke of a banner, inquired Betsy. Yes, said the general, pulling from his pocket a piece of paper. I have made a drawing, and should like you to make it out of bunting and let us see how it looks. Betsy looked at the drawing, studying it. But general, she said, these stars have six points. Does he not think five points would look better? Yes, I do, he answered. But how could they be cut into five points? That is quite simple, said Betsy, picking up a piece of cloth and her scissors. She folded it quickly, made one snip with the scissors, then, opening it out, showed the general the five-pointed star. I learned to do that as a child when I made patchwork quilts, she said. The general was delighted with this and, fascinated, insisted on seeing exactly how it was done. "'Mistress Ross, do you think you could make this banner for us at once?' asked Robert Morris. "'I have never made one, but I'm sure I can and will be delighted to do it. I'll have it ready by tomorrow.' "'You understand about the colors?' asked the general. "'The stripes of red and white, the square of blue with white stars?' "'Yes, I understand. And the stars five-pointed,' smiled Betsy." The gentleman arose to go. As the general bade Betsy goodbye, he took her hand and said, My little Quaker girl is serving her country well. Betsy went back into the sitting room after her guests had gone and sat down for a minute. She felt greatly honored at this request to make a banner for the American troops and was much excited over the visit of these great and important men. She looked at the drawing made by General Washington. Thirteen stripes, red and white alternating, in a square of blue, joining them together. And on the blue square, thirteen stars marking a circle. She put the drawing carefully away, and then, taking a cap from the peg on the wall, she went quickly down to the wharf to see where Uncle James' ship was lying at anchor. Going aboard, she asked one of the seamen to let her see the ship's colors. Sure, ma'am, but what be you wanting of them? asked the inquisitive man. Never thee mind, just bring them out. He went in search of the flag and brought it to her. Betsy examined it carefully to see how it was put together, noting how it was bound with sailcloth to make it strong, and the eyelets put in for fastening to a staff. Then she visited Mr. Morris's office, where another flag was brought out from an old chest. She examined it, comparing it with the one she had seen on the ship. She was perfectly familiar with the way the seams were stitched and overlapped, and felt she could easily make the banner now to produce the materials. She went to friend Thomas's store and there found the exact shades of red and blue she wanted. She purchased the material and hurrying home set about her task. First she measured and cut the strips of red and white, then the square of blue. Then these five pointed stars were quickly cut. All the materials being ready, she sat down and put them together and said as she worked, her fingertips and thoughts flew together. A strip of wide, a strip of red, stitch, stitch. This red stands for bravery, the bloodshed in this cause. 
my John's blood and all the others who will die. Stitch, stitch. The white for purity, for honor, justice. And the peace that will come like the white dove. May it come soon. Stitch, stitch. The day was waning and the sunlight fading. Betsy moved nearer the window as she sewed, and on ran her thoughts. I wonder where this banner will go, on ships far out to sea, into battle, north and south. A vision of the youth of the land came before her eyes as they marched, weary and footsore, but with heads up, eyes always on the colors ahead, the red, white, and blue. And as she worked, with needle and thread flying along, sewing well together the strips of white and red, the square of blue and the stars of white, the material seemed to be something alive. They were not just pieces of cotton bunting, but something vital. The lifeblood that flowed through those colonies, giving them courage to stand for their rights and fight for them. The purity of soul and spirit of the fine men and women who daily went about their humble tasks with love and understanding for others in their hearts. The loyalty of friend to friend. The steadfastness of purpose. And then those stars, the states to be, standing together in a circle of faith. What a glorious symbol. The light had gone. It was dark outside the window. Betsy's head dropped with weariness. It had been a long day of steady and hard work at her sewing. She was very, very tired, and chose she laid her head gently against the folds of the new flag, the stripes of red and white and the square of blue with the circle of white stars. And she fell asleep and dreamed. She dreamed of a vast forest, all fragrant and cool, with streaks of light coming through, falling on the carpet of pine needles on which she was treading softly. And beside her walked her beloved John. He was talking softly. Dear heart, little do you dream of the great part you are playing in the history of your country. As long as time shall be, you will live to be loved by all who love their country and their flag. Truly, you do not go into battle, but you are greater than those that did. They will be remembered for a while, but you have created something that will live forever. Long ago you wished to be a builder, to have a part in the struggle for freedom and the building of this fine country of ours. Your opportunity has come. Loved and honored you will always be the maker of the American flag. Betsy awoke. It was very dark. She found the flint and tinder box and lighted a candle. She picked up her sewing, inspecting it carefully. Then, folding it tenderly, she put it away to be taken the next day to General Washington. As she climbed the stairs to her room, she vaguely remembered something of her dream. She remembered John and something he seemed to have said about her service to her country. She was very tired, and slowly she prepared for bed. Brushing her chestnut curls, looking at her reflection in the mirror, she whispered, This has been a great day. I'm so glad General Washington asked me to make the banner. Bowing her head in prayer, she thanked God for his care, the work that had been brought to her that day, and the life of the fine leader who had brought it, General George Washington. She asked God's blessing upon America, her cause, and the flag of thirteen stripes and thirteen stars, the red, white, and blue. The next day, the colors were taken to Colonel Ross to be presented to General Washington for his approval. He was well satisfied with Betsy's work. Colonel Ross sent her orders for many more banners, and now the work had become so heavy that Betsy employed several girls to help her. This extra work helped a great deal, because there were not many orders in the upholstery business. The war went on. General Washington went back to the troops in New York. The campaign was on. As the banners were finished, they were sent to the ships, to the troops in New York and elsewhere. And now, America had a flag, all her own, 13 stripes of red and white, with a field of blue displaying a circle of 13 stars. And that, little buddies, is the story of the very first American flag, Old Glory, we call her, and she's changed over the years. It's been almost two and a half centuries since that flag was made, maybe a little more, come to think of it. And although it's changed a little in form, it's added a lot of stars, 
Still, we salute that flag with pride and thankfulness to God for the freedom that we enjoy in this country. And I hope, my young friends, that you will grow up to be as dedicated to the freedom and justice that made America as those who sacrificed their lives, their fortunes, but not their sacred honor so many years ago. And I must leave you for today, but I leave you as always with my loving exhortation. Always put God first in your life. Be a patriotic American and honor thy father and thy mother. So long. Parents, if your kids enjoyed their visit with Uncle Rick, know that they will love the Uncle Rick Audiobook Club. The Uncle Rick Audiobook Club allows access to dozens more stories both from history and the Bible, to help your kids learn about godly character. Here's what one parent had to say about the book club. My children love the stories. They make history so interesting. My son says it is because of the details that most textbooks don't include. Uncle Rick is easy to listen to. We love his accents and explanations. Thank you so much for that testimony. If you'd like to learn more about the Uncle Rick book club, Please join us over at UncleRickAudios.com. That is UncleRickAudios.com. See you there.